Would you pray this prayer with me? Would you say, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, Son of the living God, God, have mercy on me, me, a sinner. sinner. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ, Son of the living God, God, have mercy on me, me, a sinner. When I look out into the horizon and I kind of take a moment or two to be futuristic and say, where are we headed in youth ministry? I'm hopeful that we can get past some of what has kept us from getting there already. I interact with hundreds of youth workers across North America throughout the year, and most of the youth workers that I interact with are leading from a place of despair. I don't mean that they're leading out of a place of their own personal darkness or depression. I mean they're leading out of a place that is driven by the fear and the anxiety they have of the brokenness of this world rather than the hopefulness that they have in this world. So as I look out into the horizon, I hope to see hundreds of youth workers joining me in a march toward hope that God is in the process of restoring the world to its intended wholeness and that you and I are privileged to participate in that. You see, what happens when you lead out of a place of despair is you are driven by fears and anxieties about the culture around you. And the things that begin to lead you to the decisions that you make are not the things of God's movement forward, but they're things of cultural's movement downward. You see, brokenness is a reality for sure, but hope also grows in winter. Hope grows when all seems like is lost and broken and distorted and confused. Hope continues to grow. It grows without you because God is. And so I meet youth workers who are so afraid of what culture is going to do to their students that they can only almost work towards trying to put this force field around their kids, their teens, their students, whatever words you use. And instead of thinking about how God is majestically moving in the world and we're a part of that, they're stuck in this place of leading out of despair thinking about how can I protect my kids How can I keep them from finding some of the truths about this culture that we live in? How do I prevent them from almost sometimes asking the questions that will lead down a path that I don't have answers to? Despair makes you desperate. Makes you chase things that maybe aren't even really there. One of the common factors of people that I know who lead out of this sense of despair is that they're always trying to measure what they do, and they measure it in quantity. There was a Spanish philosopher by the name of uh, Gassat, and he said that when you measure quantity, you can only measure the minimum, because that's what you have. But when you measure quality, you measure the highest conceivable. And so we get stuck in measurements and things like this because what it is is those uh, uh, evaluations of what we're doing help us to feel as though even in the midst of this despair, something is working. And in a sense, we create this false reality that our teens are in this place where they're protected, they're cared for, and they're loved. And far too often what happens is we actually, without even thinking about it, almost treat them as objects, as victims in some senses. We impose our will on them. There's a theologian by the name of Weinkoop who talks about how sometimes we can approach relationships like a hammer to a nail or a dentist to teeth. 
This idea that we're just imposing our will, our agenda is imposed on you as a student instead of realizing that within you is this moral autonomy, this hope that's already been birthed in them, we call the Imago Dei, in which they too can find the goodness of life and live forward into this hope and imagine the way the world could be as opposed to the way the world is. What happens, you see, when we lead out of this place of despair is we can often depersonalize the gospel. Eugene Peters says the gospel, if it is not personal, is nothing. And when we depersonalize the gospel, what we do is we allow Jesus to be the supplement to the dominant ways of the world instead of an alternative to the ways of the world. And this gospel, not just the first four books of the Bible, but the full narrative gospel that's being lived out even today is depersonalized. Jesus becomes a plan as opposed to a person. When you live out of despair instead of hope, and you, 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 instead of this hopeful imagination of what God can do in the world through us, you live in this place that this is what's going on, how do I protect my teens from it? It depersonalizes the gospel. Here's another thing I think it does. I think it minimizes the atoning work of the cross and the resurrection. Because if you're Hopeful, you believe that the life, the death, and the burial, the resurrection of Jesus is sufficient. That it is enough. It is enough. The work has been done. The mission is moving forward. Hope grows in winter. It's there. It's moving. It's about finding this place on the journey. A few weeks ago, I was with a team of youth workers in Kansas City where I live, and they'd asked me just to come in and spend some time with them, and it was a church not far from my home, and so pretty much I swung, swung home from my office to their church and spent an hour with them. And the first question I was asked was, how do we make sure that our teens grow up and know how to defend the Bible as truth. So I said, let me get this straight. Your whole idea of bringing me here is to help you try to figure out how to make sure that the Bible doesn't lose any ground in culture. Like, what are you trying to do with this? Well, the pastor said, we're afraid that teens no longer have the same priority that their parents did about what the Bible is as a rule book for their life. And I said, well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to help you. I said, well, what do you mean? I said, I just don't see it like that. God is as active today as He was yesterday as He will be tomorrow. And it's in that that I find my hope. And so I don't lay awake at night sleepless over whether or not a student knows how to defend whether the Bible is true and accurate and real and how they can quote scripture. Instead, I look at it and go, what if we were to paint a picture about what it really looks like to live out the the theology in the Bible to the culture around us? I'm not, minim- I'm not saying it's not important to know the scriptures. And, and I'm, What I'm saying is that when the emphasis is only on the defense of it, it puts teens in a posture where they can only look at the negative things that are happening in culture instead of saying, oh, look at what God is doing in the world around us. I was moved by the do something presentation today. Do something. And I thought, how simple is that? Do something. And there's a lot of hope there. You can see it in the presenter's whole body language and her presentation. There's hope that things in the world are going to be great. While we can't maybe fix it, what we can do is join God in it 
as God is restoring it and making it new. Hopeful imagination repersonalizes the gospel and it reprioritizes the atonement where it should be. It is enough. The work of the resurrection, the cross, is enough. I was talking with a friend of mine named Paul and I was talking about how I had engaged a dialogue on a particular blog about how it was by an evangelical leader who was talking about how if, G, if, if our teens just knew that Jesus wanted to be their friend, everything would be okay. And I hate that language. I don't talk about Jesus as a friend. I talk about Jesus as the king. And so what I said to this person, this friend of mine, Paul, is, you know, the problem with youth ministry is everybody wants Jesus to be these kids' friends instead of the fact that Jesus is their king. He said, no, you know, no, no, no. The problem with youth ministry is that there's a problem with youth ministry. Meaning, we've lost this idea that the cross and the atoning work and the resurrection is enough. You are not Jesus. You are called to be like Jesus. The work has been done. Work towards repersonalizing the gospel, making it real again. Jesus is not a plan, he's a person. That's lived out through you. In your community. And a severe commitment to a hopeful imagination is what I believe will inspire our teens to do something. And to live toward what it means to participate in the redemptive work of God in this world. Thanks.